Well, this is interesting. This is very interesting, and this is going to be probably late going live, but hopefully you'll still all enjoy it. Candleships of Science Fiction, Battle Stars vs. Star Destroyers. And, well, this was quite a doozy to, to get it to work through, because it started off being a fun one. It started off being something which was just going to be, you know, quickly put through... Probably a few historical giggles, and just generally looking at the ships and going, Oh my lord, they need to pick up a history book. But, A, I was surprised by how well most did. In fact, I ended up, I have to admit, the ones who did worst, I have not made it, they made the cut. Um... Some were really, really atrocious. But I generally decided that that would just end up me being rather not serious and spending the whole time going, ha ha, oh good lord. Whereas some of them, vast majority of them, actually scored quite well. They are quite high scoring ships because, believe it or not, the big factors for most capital ships are that they have... They're big, and they're there. They are a presence. And that's a big factor. And most of them, most of them scored pretty darn highly on that. Now, please note, there is a reason why I didn't just leave it as capital ships of science fiction. Of course, for someone who is a bit of a destroyer historian, just a bit of one, and has actually done a book on this, and is a, a book on free British class of destroyers, and is currently working on hopefully hopefully ability to purchase pictures or rather the rights to use pictures uh, allowing will be putting a whole load of um, books out soon but especially one on the flower class so usually I focus in on the smaller ships in terms of my publication but but and I say this as the glorious Glutimus Maximus of but Star Destroyers have always struck me as a rather cool idea because, you see, the Destroyer starts off as basically a torpedo boat. And speaking of those, I'm doing a whole video about those, a live one, tomorrow evening when this comes out. But... They grow. They grow from being a torpedo boat to being the primary escort of most flotillas, which had been a role for small cruisers. And then as time goes on, they become the stand-ins for cruisers. And eventually, nowadays, you will find destroyers in the world's navies, but you won't find that many cruisers. And they have roles. And it kind of intrigues me, the idea that they just keep growing and growing, you know. We've got, we had, of course, through deck cruisers at one point for the Royal Navy. There was a few glorious days while they were called that before they eventually settled on baby aircraft carriers, or rather, invincible class aircraft carriers. But, and I keep using but, but, you know, hey-ho, it's coming in a bit. But... There are already aviation destroyers in the Imperial Japanese Navy. Just putting that out there because, you know, some of these Star Destroyers. Interesting. So what is the metric for assessment? What is the metric we're using? Well, starting off with presence. It's basically the rule of cool. And I'm sorry to say that is the way it is with presence. If you don't look good, you ain't gonna be have the presence you need. As a capital ship, you need to be large and in charge. You need to be... Hello, everyone look at me now. That is your purpose in peacetime. Now, there are other advantages. If they are bigger, newer, more everything is better, they tend to be better in terms of their presence, but 
There is still factors out there. Other ones. Capability. Is it able to do its job? Because if you have a, pres a ship which is large, in charge, wonderful, but cannot actually do its job. Mm, doesn't help at all. How well is it able to its job? Now, this is where it gets into interesting things. This is where I start to have discussions about things like Imperial Star Destroyers. That's going to be coming up soon. But how well is it able to do its job is a factor. But there is something I've noticed. Broadly speaking, hero ships tend to be far more capable of doing their job than the bad guy ships, if we're going to call them that way. And... Sometimes they get really, really, really interesting in terms of something having some issues. How large an area can it affect? Well, this is especially especially interesting when we're talking about well things like spaceships, because you see, if you're looking at a battleship versus an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier has a large area of effect because of the reach of its aircraft. However, you're more likely to send a battleship into a port to say hello to everyone. So it can have an, a larger area of effect due to its presence and image that people will see. This is, you know, we can go and visit this. Whereas you don't always want to bring the aircraft carrier into a port and have the locals wandering around it. It's far more difficult to close off all the areas you want to on an aircraft carrier than on a battleship. You also, surprise enough, used to, when you had the two Pier 2 going around the time, battleships used to have slightly bigger crews in terms of having the personnel that you'd use for closing off on a ship. How difficult is it to deploy and support? Because, especially in science fiction, especially in space, there is no point having a glorious capital ship which can never leave your own planet's orbit. Well, I suppose there is a point. It can defend. No, really, it can't. Let's be honest. If it's sitting in orbit of your planet, it's pretty much a space station, and it's probably cheaper to build a space station than a spaceship at that point. And... The worst place to defend a planet from is in its orbit. The absolute worst place to try and defend a planet is in its orbit. Because that's the point at which you've got maximum target, minimal coverage. Yeah. Best place to defend your planet from is over the enemy's planet. Yeah. How well does it fit the requirements of the operator? I did they get something because everyone else has one, but really it doesn't work for them. A good example of this is going to be some of the people who have battleships and large ships in the 1900s. Some navies really don't need them for some reason. Some navies they get battle cruisers, and arguably they don't need battle cruisers. Arguably, battle cruisers do not make sense for what they are doing and what their what global reach options are. And because there is a very discreet, for want of a better phrase, business case or mission profile for which a battle cruiser is useful. It's so like today. There are certain nations which, if you look at their risk profile, probably should actually have an aircraft carrier. And there are others which do have an aircraft carrier, and you sit there and look at them going, for for your risk profile, why do you have one just to say you can have, you have one? That's literally one nation which fits in that category. And unique bonus features. What is there included that no one else really has in theirs, and does it help or hinder? Now, I was planning on using university grading, you know, first class honours, 70% and above, upper, you know, doing that. And when there was a whole range, when I first started off with the first six, and it was a nice range, that made sense. But the vast majority of the ones I've included in this one, in fact, all the ones I've included in this video, 
would actually fit up in the upper second class or first class honours. So, in the nicest way, they've done pretty good. But there again, the rule of cool is a factor. And that helps them. So, here's a historical example. HMS Warspite. Now, why have I put her in here? Because I've put in some baseline examples to give you some ideas of what I'm talking about. And I haven't gone necessarily for the things which would actually get the highest grades or the lowest grades. But Warspite is a good example. She's got 17 on the presence. Let's be honest, she's a 15-inch gun battleship, and when she's launched, that's a big factor. She's also, capability-wise, pretty darn a decent fit for Britain, and she's fairly fast. Utility. Okay, not the easiest thing to deploy around the world, but not the most difficult either. Fit for Britain's needs. They would have preferred her if she'd been faster, but yeah, she fit very well. And unique. Well, in the case of Warspite, there is a very specific thing you have to consider about her. She is probably the only living ship which you can say actually had some form of plot armour. She literally did donuts in front of the German high seas fleet. Solo. Because her rudder decided to not play up. And survived. I mean, some ships have an aura that goes in front of them. And you hear about them coming before they arrive and you go, Oh, that's going to be a good ship. There are other ships, and I would include things like potentially USS Enterprise in this example... Which, they don't really have an aura. They don't really need an aura. They span the world with their mythology while in their lifetime. The mere thought they might come to your theatre has an impact on you. I think possibly the USS Wisconsin also has a similar image, judging by some of the recent YouTube shorts I've seen, where the idea is that if there's a war in certain parts of the world, the US Navy will reactivate her. For those parts of the world, I hope that's not the case. But USS Wisconsin does look pretty ready. She really does. And no, I don't know why they've picked Wisconsin. I, I don't know why that one gets it. But, anyway. Warspite. 86 out of 100. Well into first class territory. Well into first class. Not perfect. But there again, I'm an academic. It was marking season not that long ago. I don't think I gave a single essay 100%. Nope. I gave one over 90, though. I think they got 91. And I remember that because that was the only one that got bro that broke the middle mid-80s. Yeah. They were good essays, though. Then we have the Peter Valicki, which is... Well, technically there is a second Kirov class that is still sort of working. It's been going through the world's longest running refit. But honestly, the Peter Vilecki is it. She's the one that has been running around the world and is currently not, I think, but you know, theoretically viable. And she has a presence, let's be honest. She's the sole example of her kind wandering around the woman, and that gives her extra presence. She's also nuclear powered, and that gives her extra presence. However, she's still only got 14. Why? The problem is another factor which goes into the whole presence mission, if we sort of go into that. Sorry, someone appeared at my window waving, so I had to uh, pause and answer. They... Why is it only 14 out of 20 for presence? Well, she's got a small problem. The nuclear power that gives her her capabilities to wander around the world freely and be quite so independent means that she actually can't go and visit as many ports as she probably would be usefully deployed to 
because not all nations or, and not all ports, even in nations which would, would like her visiting them. Because they worry about nuclear-powered ships. They worry about all ships which have nuclear power next to them. There's a, a similar reason why US Navy aircraft carriers, even into in, the ports of some very good allies which they might wish to enter, in the very rare occasion they'd actually wish to enter a port, don't want them to go in there. Because they don't all trust nuclear power. Which means that as unique and a capability as she is, as a theoretical major presence as she could be, she's also not able to be. Then we have a cable. She's a good all-round ship, at least as she's designed. And by the way, please note, I am not going to be going into massive depths of their individual technologies. What you have to consider to an extent is once we get into that level of microanalysis in science fiction ones, I'm going to be comparing and contrasting between completely different universes which have often some contrary laws of physics it seems or at least some contrary contrary rules of energy and uh, therefore i'm not going to do that on these ships either because this whole is to form a sort of basis and idea of what we'll be approaching in the science fiction ships utility 16 out of 20 She's a very flexible asset. Fit. For the Soviet Union, and even for modern Russia, she is a very good fit. I, she gives them a lot of presence without the complication of trying to operate an aircraft carrier. And... Kuznetsov is a vessel which is a legend in its own time, the current remaining uh, Russian aircraft carrier. But it's mostly a legend for most of us are still amazed it's still afloat. Not due to enemy action, please note. That's not, it's not talking about any kind of wars, etc. or anything like that. No. We've just been seeing it going around the world over the years, and the thing seems to be cursed. I mean, dockyard fires, cranes collapsing on it. Everything that can go wrong, often quite badly wrong, happens to it. I mean, you can point to individual events in other ships, in other navies' experience. They usually have had one or two, and you can go, well, you know, other ships have had this, haven't other ships. But very few ships have collected them all. It's like the number of random accidents are Pokemon, and Kuznetsov is the world's best Pokemon collector. Because it is gonna catch them all. It is gonna catch them all. But Peter Villicky has been good. She hasn't, mostly. She's mostly kept going, kept wandering, and that's why she made it to a cool 79 out of 100. Which is still, I'll remind you, and I will say this, 79 is still in the first class honours category. So, she's in a first. She's the same category, in terms of getting a first, as Warspite. But Warspite is ahead of her. That's also because, don't take this the wrong way, if, if they had been close, I would have adjusted it so Warspite was ahead at least for one. Because again, Warspite, they're building an SSBN Dreadnought class um, vessel, which is going to be named Warspite. And I would be worried that the machine spirit that obviously inhabits that vessel will be launching something at me if I've made her lower than anyone else that roughly looks like her. I think she, I, I'm hoping she'll ignore battle aircraft carriers, okay? And science fiction ships. But on the grounds that, this is why there isn't, uh, there isn't an Iowa class battleship done in this. No, anything which could re be remotely similar but could outrank her in any way, I am just, you know, just, just not putting in there for my own personal safety, okay? My own personal safety. This is a ship which, when it was told it was going to Breggers Yard, decided to give itself a Cornish vacation instead. Yeah. It decided to retire at St. Michael's Mount. But she did well. She's a good-looking ship. Then we have Yamato. Now, I was really surprised when I started working through these figures because Presence, of course, it's the biggest and the best battleship of this period in the world. Capability, 
arguably, arguably one of the most capable battleships ever built. Fit. That was interesting. Utility. Ooh, that was a, a bit of a problem, because it drank oil like I drink iron brew. In fact, no, it could out-drink me. So, me drinking iron brew, it drinking oil, it would out-drink me. And that's a problem for Japan. And then, unique. There's nothing really any detrimental about it, but the fact is, and this isn't really to do with the ship, but to do with the program, the Japanese built these ships so they would have these statements to stay around the world as a way of deterring conflict. And they even discuss that when they're building, that they're building to deter conflict. And then they keep it secret. And do you know what? Secret things have deterred zero conflicts. Because if people don't know you have them, they don't factor them into their thinking. So they don't stop any conflicts. At no point does keeping your big super weapon a secret stop a war. Saying you have your big super weapon, parading it around and going, do you really want to fight it? That can stop wars. I think in the case of the Yamato and the Mushashi, I think, you know, those two sisters, what they would have done would probably put a pause on World War II happening. I'm fairly certain the US Navy would have probably been pulled back slightly, might have modulated their tone slightly, while they rapidly built some super Montana, Iowa, super duper ship that could go out and crush it. And I know the paper stats. You can sit there in paper stats and go, well, Niowa could, you know, match in against this and all sorts of things. Yes. But the sheer presence, size of the thing. In certain point, ca uh, capital ships are not about spooking professionals or people who are passionate, interested parties. They're about spooking politicians. And they tend to be a far more visual breed, a far more visually inclined creature. They're far less likely to read the detailed pages and pages of stats and work out that actually in Iowa, King George V probably could match in and give it a good run for its money. And if you've got a couple of them turning up of each, well, yeah, they're going to have some fun here. It, it, there is a good chance of them winning. Politicians will go, but it's got 18 inch guns and it's massive. And there'll probably be some animals in there going, but they've only got two. They've got two. But it's ma two. They haven't got the fuel to keep moving anywhere. Two. It's going to be uh, probably going to be some British and American animals sitting there going, we're going to start a club. It's for, the, uh, oh, for those of us who tried to explain that it doesn't matter, doesn't matter that much. And um, basically the club is going to get together once a year on the date which they reveal them to the world. And we're just going to commiserate with each other. How's that sound, gents? Yes, all good. That 1920s, 1930s animals. And a, a contemporary example, number two, USS Georgia, SSGN 729. Now, presence. Well, that's a zero, surprisingly enough. I know, this is going to shock you all. She doesn't have a lot of presence, but she goes around the world under the water. That's her purpose, is to have an absence of presence. Basically, for her to have presence, she either has to surface and shout at people going, Hello, here I am. Or some nincompoop has to tell the other side exactly where she is. Neither of those are sensible options. However, she's still a capital ship. You know, if you consider her capabilities, her reach, her fl uh, how she's used, she's a capital ship. She's a strategic asset. And her capability is top of the line. Her utility is top of the line. Her fit, decent. Her uniqueness, well, 
with added seal deployment chamber. I added on for that one. And that's 15 out of 20, so that took it to 73 out of 100. Solid first. And a very nice submarine. And also special to my heart as well, because when I was much younger, much younger, I was required to write an essay in my GCC English group about any topic I wanted, but I had to make up an entire fictional world. And I decided to do underwater cruising submarines for people to go on voyages underwater. And I actually used USS Georgia because what I had was in the fictional world, she was decommissioned, bought by a billionaire, and in, had her ballistic missile tubes turned into a, sort of hotel rooms with visual pods. It was an idea. Look, it got me an A, so she has a special place in my heart. <sighs> the Almiranti Latour. Now, this was a hard one, because I was going through and thinking, this is going to be good. This is part of the South American Dreadnought race. But actually, present, 16 out of 20. Capability, 17 out of 20. Utility, 17 out of 20. Fit, 15 out of 20. UB, she has nothing you can really list. She is as standard as they come. And I did consider, did consider making her roughly a 10 for that. And because it's nothing negative either. And so that would have made a 75 out of 100. But honestly, that didn't work for her. Because one of the great things about her was she was a solid, reliable ship. And so whilst I could probably have given her five for that being that, just the solid, reliable ethos, I felt that would also take away from the fact there wasn't, that specifically the Chileans didn't want anything unique or amazing about her. They wanted her to be good, a good fit for them. They wanted her to be easy to support for them. That was the whole purpose of her. And that was good. And then, contemporary example, HMS Queen Elizabeth. I did consider putting a US aircraft carrier in here. I did. But then I remembered I'm British. And also, this allows me to talk about some other interesting things in the UNB category. And if we go back to the UNB category, you will see. Come on, skip through slides. Da -da 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 -da. It's unique bonus features. And all of the unique bonus features that come for the Ford class are electronic gizmos and really cool. The unique bonus features on the Queen Nessa class. Twin islands, which make it very distinctive, actually add to its presence. A bar, and I'm talking not just any bar, but an actual pub with an actual wooden bar is built in there to help them with diplomacy and also the officer's mess. And you sit there and go, well, that sort of thing adds up. Not many other ships have that sort of facility. In fact, there's none I can think of the new build ones that do. Unless they're a cruise ship. So that's cool. And that's useful. Presence, 17 out of 20. Let's be honest, the Queen Elizabeth class carriers do have a presence. You see them, you know exactly which navy is turned up. You know exactly what they look like, uh, what they are. Capability, 16 out of 20. I would love them to have been slightly longer. I'm sorry, I do. I, I wish they'd been slightly longer and be able to carry slightly more aircraft. I just think it would have made life a lot easier for us longer term in terms of Britain. But that's my bugbear. But 16 out of 20, not bad. Utility, 17 out of 20. Yes, they're gas powered, but they can pick up gas from almost anywhere and lots of ports will allow them to go in there. And fit for Britain, again, I'd like them to have been longer. But honestly... They fit Britain's needs fairly well. And I'd love some LHDs or some kind of thing like that to replace Albion and Bulwark. I doubt I'm going to get those, but I will keep on arguing for them. Because I'd like those extra flight decks and then you'd have multiple ships 
which could all take the same aircraft and could all be you uh, it could be used uh, you know you'd have two strike flight decks you'd have two maybe three amphibious flight decks but all five could operate the same helicopters all five could operate the same fixed wing aviation all fire therefore if you need to if you in an emergency if you're short both your aircraft carriers but you have another amphib available yay amphib active Instead of Holy Spirit activate, it would be Carrier Form Activate! Carrier Form Activate! It would work. Yes, I spend way too much time on YouTube Shorts at the moment, but that's mainly because I'm hunting Corgi and Poodle videos. Other stuff comes up in between them, which really ruins my viewing time. But I'm looking for Corgi and Poodle videos. Preferably videos of both together, but... <sighs> I'll take what I get. But no, overall, pretty good. So, there we go. Those are our contemporary and historical examples to give you a bit of a baseline. Ideas of how we're approaching this topic. So now, I've recharged the Iron Brew. Into the science fiction. Into the science fiction we go. Ah, uh, the Executor 1 and 2 class Star Dreadnought. Okay, look. Probably the most egregious example of they're the bad guys. We're going to give them shits which look cool, but which actually are terrible in so many ways, we'll be able to dance around them. It was actually quite disturbing when I started looking at them and going, but it's so massive. Why, could, why is this not scoring higher? Going through the system. They have a massive presence. They are all about the presence. But their capability, 18 out of 20, and let's be honest, that's me mostly going they have a lot of guns, and they do carry quite a lot of TIE fighters, to make up for the fact their maneuverability is... ship. Yeah. Their maneuverability is, in fact... Best described and artic articulated as frigating ship. It's terrible. Utility. Do not try and put these in any way, in any shape or form at the end of a logistics chain. They are really not good logistically. They'd require a huge amount of supplies. You think those Imperial Star Destroyers require a lot of supplies. Compared to the Super Star Dreadnoughts, oh my lord. Fit. Well, I have many times been heard to say that the Empire decide to create a job creation program rather than a sensible military. That is it. It is Fit for purpose from that perspective, hence it gets a 10. Creates a lot of jobs. Creates a lot of employment. Militarily wise, though, having a superstar dreadnought or a superstar destroyer, whatever you want to call it, you could get so many Imperial Star Destroyers for it. Or even better, anything else. You could get any of the number of smaller cruisers which go around the Star Wars universe and are actually useful. I mean, you have so many planets you need to be around. There is so much you need to control. Controlling by fear alone doesn't work. Okay? We know this. We know naval diplomacy. We know naval presence. We know how to do conflict management. It's something that I, with my background, if War, PhD, War Studies, MSc, International Conflict, and Bachelors in History have worked a lot with. Working with the, uh, with the Royal Navy, all sorts of things I've, I have been lucky enough to have, chance, have a chance to work with. They are wonderful organizations. They know this. There are lots of people who could have turned around to them and gone, well, if you're designing a system that works... What you want is you want a, a, a fleet which can rapidly deploy of heavy ships, which are really scary. Which would have fit, I suppose. 
uh, but you'll need a continual presence of ships which are constantly there, probably going to be smaller ships to be uh, constantly there, and you're going to need ships which are in, uh, which can ra rapidly influence wide areas around them and be part of larger tracking operations. Do not keep sinking all your money into Death Stars and these things. Don't. As I know it gets 72. I know, I know that's 72 there. I, I realize it. And I know you're all sitting there going, but that, that's a first, Alex. That's the one. Yeah. If you look at the score, it's got them because of presence and its sheer amount of guns and weaponry and troops it carries. Every other category, it is so low, it is embarrassing. Every other category. Once you start looking and asking those questions. <sighs> Chips, class warship. This was a pleasant surprise because honestly, when I started off looking at this, I was going, that's gonna be in the 40s. That's gonna be in the 40s. But presence, it I had to give a good mask one up because let's be honest, it turns up in its universe and it's a pyramid. And that's a pretty cool looking shape. And capability, it can make an entire planet quake in fear, but for that, they need to know they're there. Utility. Unfortunately, the Gwald never really understood much about utility. The few of them who do seem to understand those sort of things don't seem to get that high. I, I presume because to understand utility and logistics and those things, you need to have the humility to understand that occasionally things are going to go wrong, and so factor that into your planning. Um... Utility is all about going, can this work? Will this work? Should this work? This won't work. What can we do instead of that? That's pretty much. Fit. It fits to Gual to a T, though, because it's all about image, about projection, about, ooh, look at how I'm here, look at how godlike I am. And actually, that's a really interesting thing, because there was a whole debate as to whether Chiops is a type of Hatak, which is going to actually appear later, it got slightly higher scores, or whether it's a separate class. And honestly, in terms of fit, in terms of projecting the image of a godlike race, the Hatak doesn't look as good. Because it doesn't have this wonderful clean lines, this... This looking like a pyramid, this looks like a god's ship through the stars. Whereas the Hatak looks like a jolly great big spaceship. It's more capable, and it, hence it's further along the list, because you might have noticed we're going up in uh, grading. So we've started 72, and well, we've got the 72, but I think this is more deserving of it 72 than the other one, because whilst, yes, honestly, the UB is less. Everything else is decent. And, again, the point I would make is, the Gwald, for all their many, many things, they are arrogant twits. We know that. That's part of their whole reason for being the raison d'etre, the whole reason they managed to lose control of Earth in the first place in this universe, is because of that. That is a factor, therefore, into their thinking. Whereas, with the Empire, with supposedly great luminaries like Tarkin, etc., who have been through definitely one major galactic size, galactic scale war, i.e. the Civil War, you would expect them to have a better understanding of what they needed to do. Because... They went through it and had to actually operate it and did actually operate better ships for what they actually needed to do than they ended up. And this is why, again, on the 72, it's like it's they're stuck to it for the Imperial ships. 
Okay. Let's start off with this. This is a battleship constabulary per capital ship. Yes, it has some TIE fighters on. Yes, it has a load of troops to land. Yes, all that's true. But it's primary weaponry. It's not its fighters. It's its, tur it's, its weapons. It's laser turbo blasts. It's turrets. And this really annoys me because here is a thing. I have got so many large turrets on this ship, and I am putting them down my sight. I have got, let's say, eight. Four on either side. Okay? In fact, to give them a specific name, I have got eight octuple turbo laser barbettes, which are a primary weapon I use for my anti-ship engagements and I've got 60 batteries and I've got 60 heavy iron and carry on placements and they are all down the edges of my ship okay those barbettes that's not a, there are four on either side however I am a wedge shaped design ship I am supposed to be fire, uh, designed as a wedge shape, so I present all my firepower to the front so I can fire forwards. However, I am also going to dive straight into the enemy and be battling against them all around me. This is where it gets problematic, because if you took those systems, and instead you put five in a V formation, one centre, and then you stacked three more, super firing, one after the other, up behind that last one. You were uh, the, the center one on the top of the V. You would therefore end up with six able to cover either side and still have all of them able to fire forward. Which is a far more efficient use of firepower. And I know some people are going to come with, there are in, in universe reasons for why not to do this. You... That's such a stupid positioning, though. Once you get onto turret, the whole reason that ironclad frigates, etc., didn't have turrets was because they had sails. So they had to have their weapons around their sails. The moment they have engines, and they can build themselves forward and backwards, and they you can build even build outside, and can put the weapons up in turrets so they can fire around, especially once they get bigger. Bad or tougher weapons, you do that. You give yourself the flexibility. Again, though, absolutely pain in next to support. Fairly decent capability, but just not as good as it could be because the other problem with them, and it's the same problem with the Star Dreadnoughts, is that they. In order to control something, they have to be within turbo laser range of it. They have to be physically near it, and sh which means you're going to be putting a lot of strain on your capital ships, and they're going to have to be moving around physically to places. That also means they're kind of more predictable in their deployments, and this is part of the advantages that the Resistance Rebellion uses against them. They have to be physically in the system for their fighters and everything to be working in that system. You cannot deploy your fighters to one system, you go to another system, and then meet up in a third system. You do not have that tactical flexibility. And the loss of that is a big impact on something the size of the Empire. Yes, they are a great job creation program. Yes, the advantage of that means that everything is far more centralized control. You have far less freedom maneuver for the fighter pilots. You have far less freedom maneuver even for the ship's commanders because they're tied to their fighters. They're tied to their personnel far more. So you can say, you know, that does lock down the system to allow the Empire more control over their ships, but at expense of being able to really control the Empire. It's a trade off. Do you trust your own ship's captains and crews? If not, then fine. But if if you don't trust them, then why are they commanding something which has that much firepower? 
Because, frankly, that's scary and pretty stupid. There again, though. Farscape. Now, honestly, I wanted to put this one in because I thought next year is going to be the year of the aircraft carrier and the flagship. And so next year, I'll probably do a video about this. And the thing I found most interesting is that there is a Lego, a Lego Peacekeeper Command Carrier that you can buy. I'm sure it's not proper Lego. I'm sure it's one of the other people who use Lego under the French, who uh, have the uh, r allowance to use Lego style bricks. Either way, pretty darn cool. Presents. Well, let's be honest, if that thing turns up, you're going to know who it is, because... Who else is going to be turning up with something that big, that size, and that shape? And it's got a crew of roughly 5,000 and can ca has 50,000 deployable personnel aboard. Commandos, fighters, all sorts of things it can deploy. It's... It's capable. It's basically everything that, in some regards, that should have been. When you consider the size of the number of personnel and the scope you've, you're putting into it. Now, fit, pretty darn perfect. Utility, fairly self-supporting. However, the thing is, most of the images of them are of them getting blown up. Which doesn't really give them that good a reputation. You hear about their their uh, their absolutely epic fights and battles, what they did, their huge efforts, and yet at the same time you look at them and go, "But you got destroyed." <sighs> Basically, incredibly capable ships should never be allowed to go anywhere without support, because whilst they have a lot of weapons and can theoretically take on battleships and dreadnoughts in their, in their universe, they also can apparently get taken apart by some surprisingly smaller nations, or rather civilizations in that universe, I suspect. But still, interesting ships. And wouldn't mind building the model. Would not mind building a model at all. But onwards and upwards. Hatak, the super pyramid ship. Doing slightly better than its predecessor or other subsidiary, the Chiof, in terms of actual capability, but less on the presence. Mainly because it actually looks like a spaceship, not like a godly starship. Um, it doesn't look like you have literally flown a monument through space. This actually looks like a... Yep. Yeah, we're going to go fight someone now. Sorry. But we are. They are some of the most powerful ships in their universe. And it's, it's worthy to remember that. Because they are really quite capable. However, however... Often, you see them getting blown up. And this is one of the things I did actually have to say I liked about this universe. I liked about Stargate. Yes, the ships have some interesting capabilities. But often their flaws come not from their design or their capabilities. But actually the people who are operating them. Which always seemed more realistic to me. Than anyone who's going to spend that much amount of time, effort and technology building such a ship as this you're gonna be able to get the tech right the tech's probably gonna have got to the point to which um you don't even think about doing it anymore and you have servants to do it for you but you're gonna get a tech right what happens next well that's up to the ego of the person put in charge of it and that was their problem, really. Far, far too many egos involved. It, even when they were under control of the Tukra, or the Free Jafar Nation, they were still 
still very ego driven. They knew what a powerful ship was. They had the image of how they were handling it was still the same as it had always been handled. Because in many ways, the Gwald weapon systems and all the Gwald idea was around presence. It was around projecting godlike power. Their weaponry was focused on intimidation, on fear, and on not really caring much for the lives of the people who followed them or the people who they were killing. They just didn't care. So you didn't worry about the effectiveness of your weaponry because, yeah, if it took a few hundred more Jafar than a more effective weapon system would to take something, that didn't matter to you. What matters to you was whether you took it or not, because that would make you look godlike and powerful. If you fail to take it, that would make you look less godlike and less powerful. And if you couldn't have it, well, you smote it. And that's what your hat pack could do. Hence, I called it the Super Pyramid Ship. Because, let's be honest, it is a Super Pyramid Ship. Ah, finally, we got to the Battle Star, which was a portion of the actual title of this video. Battle Star Galactica. Now, I did consider doing Pegasus as well in this, but frankly, she didn't do actually as well. Mainly because the Battlestar Galactica, I had to cover both versions. I've used the imagery of the modern one because that's the more recent available. But I would say that in many ways, I think the older one, if I'd scored them separately, would have actually scored higher. This is probably confusing you all. But again, it's that UB. It's that... That particular area, yes, they are the same. Theoretically, ships. They are the same. But, unique bonus features. The, the older one always felt kind of like the Millennium Falcon. It felt like it came through despite its crew. It was going to keep coming through. It's kind of the opposite of the, of the Enterprise. The Enterprise, you always feel it gets through because of its crew, and that is its unique bonus feature in some regards. Uh, for the all the Battlestar Galactica, it, you felt the ship was getting you through. Kind of like Warspite. Right at the beginning. So then we have the fit. Well, it certainly fitted their operational techniques. And again, it was far better than Pegasus. Why? Because Pegasus had... Some reason they looked into upgrading all these ships with this advanced control software, and you sit there and go, the basic premise of the previous war had been that the Cylons, who are who are machines, can out hack us, so we don't have those machines and those combined command systems in our in our ships. But no, we're going to trust our scientists who say they have managed to outsmart the Cylon's ability to do that. No, never trust your scientists on that sort of thing, because the scientists will never have any doubt that they are smarter than someone else. But that's the very basic point at which you need someone in the room who is the eternal, I don't know, contrarian to go... Excuse me. How about what we do is we test this on a few ships for at least the next 10 years. We send them wandering along the border. We make sure they're small ships, frigates. And we give them, a, they as go along as an, a part of the escort of a battle star. But every single other ship in the task group sits there, has a turret pointed on that ship. And the moment it starts doing anything weird, they fire. And the crew signed special notes. They understand it's a special duty posting. If they lose control of their ship, they will die, but their family will get a massive payout. And yes, I know the Cylons were behind it, so probably, honestly, they would just not trigger it. But that still would have made more sense than what they actually did, which was a massive fleet-wide installation of a system. Without any sort of checking. And actually, again, this is going to sound strange, but... 
possibly what I'd have done with any installation, would have been have an easy method of turning it off. I'm sorry, but again, this might have been my paranoia, but if I'd been one of the ship captains of any of the battle stars, and they'd been going, we're going to inform, put this new system in, and knowing the history, which I would probably know, because let's be honest, if you're a captain of one of the battle stars and you don't know the history, then frankly, you probably shouldn't be in charge of it. I would probably have gone, hmm. Chief? Yes, sir? Rig me something to stop that working if it looks anything weird. And when I say stop it working, I mean stop it working dead. Because if there's one thing I know, a good chief petty officer can rig that something to stop something working very easily. Now, please note, again, the phrase used there was stop sulfate working. Not, not, stop it working so we can reuse it at a later date. Stop it working so that we can reactivate it. Stop it working so that we can recover stuff from it. Stop it working. Basically, the whole way through, quite a lot of these things is... One of the things for science fiction, and I do understand in the whole fiction, you do have this scenario where you are setting up one side to be stupid, because otherwise you don't have much of a story. The reality as a historian, I would say, is that actually, if you look at history, humans have often been plenty stupid. Usually, their own arrogance and their own decisions will undermine them before you need any technology to go wrong. Or in the case of their, uh, the whole of Nazi Germany, their whole raison d'etre with technology of let's do this by committee and let's just keep adding extra stuff in till the ship or tank or everything is so pointlessly overburdened it becomes pointless and useless. But it looks great on a stat sheet so people in the future are going to be screaming about how amazing it was. But when you actually look at it in operation, you're going, but that all conflicts with that. And that doesn't work because of the compromises you need to put in that as well. In And, uh, oh, ah, oh, oh. Yeah. The secret geniuses of the Axis powers were the Italian Navy. If you want to see some well-designed ships, you look at them. And then you sit there and go, hmm. But it's kind of like the Vocha class. Now, I was having fun with this, because I was going through the Federation and Star, uh, Star Trek as a whole and thinking, what should I really put in as their capital ships? Because, honestly, most of their capital ships are called cruisers. And I thought... Eh, that doesn't matter. You've used the title Capital Ship, you're talking about Battle Stars and Star Destroyers. If they're called a cruiser, they're still a capital ship. And de facto, if we look at the way they're used, flagships, etc., they are the capital ships. And I looked at the Vorcher class. And they are, for the Klingons, surprisingly well-rounded. Now, honestly, I'm not sure if they're a good fit for the Klingons, or as good a fit as they could be, because... I've always rather liked the Klingon Bird of Prey, and I've always thought it was a rather suitable vessel for them because it allowed them to get close and board, and it had a surprising amount of firepower, whereas the Vorchak class have a very obvious amount of firepower. It's a very in-your-face amount of firepower. It's a, we're going to blow the living out of you a level of firepower, because... When they turn up, they have disruptor cannons, disruptor emitters, photon torpedo launchers, and pretty much everything else they can drag along. Honestly, I'm fairly sure that some of them might have been armed with plasma torpedoes if the warriors involved had their way. Klingons have a similar kleptocracy to, um, how do I put this, uh, appropriating things 
or a kleptocratic nature to approach uh, to appropriating things, as most Royal Navy crews in World War II when it came to small guns which could be useful for AA armament. I mean, you might think that weapon doesn't fit on that ship, but give them half a chance, they'll find a way. The fact that one of these did not go out into space armed with a massive batleth it could use to physically scythe through enemy ships is probably due to the fact that no one could find a batleth blade big enough. Not that they didn't actually consider it. And possibly they considered trying to make it, but then they remembered they weren't going to be big enough to wielding the bat left themselves, and there was probably a debate about who would actually be controlling the bat left side, and, you know, eventually it just sent into a fight and didn't happen. But these are very capable vessels. They are definitely, when they turn up, a sign of very, very high levels of Klingon interest in what is going on. And when there's a whole group of them there, they're sort of going... Oh, frigate, ship, me, that's, uh, that's a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, attack cruisers you've brought along with you. I think one of the reasons I also like them is because they do give a very, very striking image of this is the Klingon Empire. The Klingon Empire have gone with this sort of this outline shape for roughly 200 years by the point the Vorchuk class come in. And it's obviously a Klingon ship. You know that's a Klingon ship. It's as good as in the 1920s and 30s and the 1900s when ships were painted by their nations all sorts of different colours. They weren't just all grey. They were actually painted national colours in a way sort of to make them stand out. And yeah, that's a British warship. You can tell by its colour coding. That's an American one. How do they keep their ships so white? I mean, they literally have their sailors polishing it all day. But by God, it gleams. It gleams. Well, with a Vorchar turning up, you know it. You know you've got the Klingons, and you know you've got some a lot of Klingon interest, because one of these turns turn up to say hello. And I know there's Starships Online, etc. Uh, Star Trek Online, etc. And you can go find Battleships, etc. Why do they call it Starships Online? Who knows? Um, you, can call, you can go for all sorts of options. But I wanted to try and keep it to the primary canon of all the particular uh, franchises I was going into. So, Warhammer 40k. This, these figures specifically rate to the Victory class. Which are probably my favourite, although the Victory class are in some ways carriers more than they are battleships, because they have a very heavy, very heavy parasite craft armament. Which allows them to deploy marines and other personnel very quickly, and attack enemy ships far, far out of the range of their primary weapons. But they're saying that they still have a hefty dosage of primary weapons, which are designed to destroy you. So, we are talking about ships which are built as battleships in a whole scenario, a whole universe, where literally to get from A to B, you travel through, for want of a better phraseology for it, hell. You travel through hell to get from A to B. There is some symbology going on there. There is certainly some some whole entire, you know, imagery going through there, but this is what these ships are designed for. They have void shields. They have all sorts of things to try and assist them for that, but their main advantage doing that and going for doing making that transit is their sheer mass and ability to fight. And the fundamental will of their crews.
Now, with a few of these, uh, a few of these, you'll see. For more information, info, see the fleet of Imperium of Amana naval historians take on Warhammer 40k human fleet. Yes, I have done a few videos in my time on science fiction because I love it. I use science fiction a lot when I'm teaching war studies, believe it or not, when I'm teaching theories because sometimes when you're starting off with students especially from all around the world and they all have their own views and their own and they've come from their own national backgrounds and their own teaching preferences and how the stories of those wars and those battles are taught and you want them to get them into a sort of a framework where they're going to be analyzing the battles analyzing those events analyzing the history from a I wouldn't say a a, 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 a disparate perspective, but from a more analytical perspective. You start off by teaching them the tools with something where no one, no, no national pride is going to get involved. Warhammer 40k, um, Glenn Stewart's books on all all sorts of scenarios, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars. You take them into a battle. Pretty much everyone is familiar with those terminologies enough that they can get into it and you can explain it and start off and go We're looking at this battle And you teach them the skills and then you take them into a similar battle, which is a historical one And then you take them through a, another historical one and then you take them through a current day or something which is closer to a period one and So they follow in through the skills And it becomes a skill first of how you analyze it how you learn from these events and how you separate in some ways the important parts of national mythology which come from those battles quite often from the lessons you need to learn in order to hopefully stop the mistakes of that national mythology and often there are mistakes which generate national mythology you're not supposed to have a famous law a famous stand at rook's drift rook's drift should not happen if you're actually conducting your war and your logistics properly Hopefully those things don't get involved and people are able to learn the lessons instead of having an argument over the mythology. So we start off with science fiction. And Warhammer 40k is great for that because if you have a, if you have a class which you know is going to end up having a very... a very tough time going through some of the topics from a emotional perspective, you can always chuck in a whole a whole load of the orcs fighting someone because the orcs are just fun characters to look at fighting. Literally, there has never been more orcish orcs than the orcs in Warhammer 40k. I mean, they put all other orcs to shame, really, other than maybe Terry Pratchett's. Hmm. Base star. Oh yes, it outperformed. There was a purpose to outperforming the Battlestar. It was supposed to be the big bad chasing the Battlestar. The Battlestar needed to be outperformed by it. However, there are some interesting quirks here. If my satellite, if my navigation system, okay, if my sat nav started quoting poetry at me when I was asking it to work out my navigation data and where I was going, I would not think that might be the voice of God speaking to me. I would think that that is a small issue going on with the sat-nav. And the hybrids which are used to fly these ships, for want of a better phrase, they are seriously mucked up. Seriously mucked up. But saying that, they have a absolutely awe-inspiring presence. You see them, you know exactly what you're facing. They have great capability. They have lots of firepower. They have lots of ability to deploy capabilities. They are very self-sufficient. They fit the Cylons to a T. They are basically the space in the spatial embodiment of a Cylon. And... Yeah, they have some pretty unique systems which make them fit. The Cylons didn't recreate a battle star. That wasn't what they needed. They didn't need a vessel like that. They needed a vessel which 
in many ways catered to the capabilities and the needs of their integration of their systems and that is the base star and it does it very very well it really does ah the galaxy class I covered this in the galaxy class federation 24th century in my a video and I stand by pretty much everything I said in that video in that some of these ships get a really raw deal. Some of the ships are surprisingly flexible. And one of the things about the Galaxy Glass is whilst they're technically, I suppose, a large exploratory cruiser or large exploratory ship, they are very quickly and very easily adaptable into battleship. They're very quickly and easily adaptable into air, into carrier. Um, they have all sorts of facilities which allow them to be easily adaptable into things. So they are a capital ship. And it's hard to argue these are not the Federation's capital ships. Saying that, they have a very visible presence. And they have a very lot of capability. They're very self-sufficient. And they fit the Federation to a T. And they have a lot of interesting technologies, including often some very skilled crew. I'm going to say all that, but... And they get 86 out of 100. They don't get anywhere near perfect. And these are the hero ships. Why? Because they also seem to always have things going wrong in them, which the... which the I'm going to use the phrase humanoid, because broadly speaking, the crews were all humanoid. Which the organic crew... But that sounds wrong, because that excludes Mr. Data... So, in the nicest way, I'm going to get back to humanoid. The humanoid, broadly speaking, crew had to fix. That was an ongoing thing. And for the Federation, which are honestly the ones which are... The, the civilization which pitched themselves as the shining light of technology, of, of democracy, of freedom, of all these things in their universe... Having a ship which is always seeming to have weird issues as your capital ships because you've possibly pushed the experimental button a little bit too hard is a bit weird. Honestly, these are the hero ships. They are. This, it's supposed to be the best ship. It's supposed to be the most capable vessel you're seeing. And whenever they put an opponent ship up there, there's always a weakness that this ship can exploit. Even the Borg, who are probably who realistically should have just stomped them, they managed to figure a way round it, figure a way out, thanks to their innovative crew. And again, that does give them quite a high, unique, you know, standing because of their quality of their crew. But still, there are also there are the Galaxy class, which in the Dominion War get stomped and get stomped hard. Ultimately, though, good ship. Ah, the Daedalus class, and this is getting close to my top two. Now, it depends on whether or not they have the full database that they can have in there, whether they have the full capabilities, because there are some interesting things going through these ships. With the full Asgard upgrade, with the full technology that they could have in them, they were almost capable of completely independent self-support. They had the ability, like the Federation vessels, to literally turn energy into matter. And to produce their own things when they needed their own spare parts, etc. Admittedly, that is one particular episode and does involve Colonel Carter doing some amazing science and engineering 
But there's a reason of all the science fiction vessels, this is the class which actually has an emoji that my member, uh, my channel members can use. Not just because it's cute, but also because it's probably the best example we have of what human spaceships might look like given certain technological parameters. Armed with missiles, fighters, carrying a fairly decent crew. When they are armed also with beam weapons, ring uh, transport rings, and also teleportation systems. It's just an amazing capability, and it's a truly hybrid mix of technology. It makes them very unique in their scenario because they have ancient technology which Gwal technology is based on they have Asgard technology which is also to an extent based on some of their understanding of ancient technology and it has Earth technology and it also at certain points has some developments of ancient technology in that so they have a lot of different information going through them which makes them very interesting ships from the perspective of them bringing together all this information all these different systems and making them work together I'm not sure how this would develop. I'd be really interested in seeing the next generations which would come after the BC-304s. And again, there's a whole video about them because they're battle cruisers, so that interested me. But these ships are a really good example of a really well thought through science fiction capital ship. Because whilst they're nowhere near perfect, you can always see the ship in the results. It is something to do with design. It's not just the crew or not just the ship. It's the two working together. And that's what a well-designed ship will do. A well-designed ship in real life and in science fiction will allow the crew to perform their best whilst also allowing the crew to get the best out of the ship. And Deadless class are really good for that. They really are. Ah, a robot on Ascendant. I've done a video on the Glorious Heritage class for a reason. <laughs> oh. Presence. Well, that's a glorious looking ship. 17 out of 20. Capability, 18 out of 20. Utility, 20 out of 20. Pretty much rebuilding itself from scratch with no infrastructure after its entire civilization, has either disappeared, fallen, collapsed, turned insane, or hidden itself. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hefty thing, and if a ship's able to rebuild itself, its utility's great. It's fit for purpose, it's got tons of space and capable to do what it needs to do. Yeah. And it's able to fight pretty much everything. Admittedly, that is partially due to its AI, partially due to its crew, but also partially due to its construction. And interesting things I've found really about them is they are very much hollow ships. They have lots of space in between things. Designed to allow missiles to pass through them. And the idea is that it's better for a missile to pass through them, or hit impact the battle blades, than is to impact the core components of the ship because those areas were going to take a massive amount of damage because the size of missiles you're using in space combat are going to be colossal and I love this about them it means someone's fought through their design and actually fought through hang on the weapon systems you're using in space they're going to be very big because there's no point sending a small warhead I mean, an AIM-120 is a great system, but you're not going to use a warhead that size if for a space combat against something the size of this. You're just not. So in which case, if the warheads hit, no amount of armor is going to protect you. And it's got layered defense systems, it's got fighters, it's got drones, it's got everything out there, and the whole system works. Hence, they have the standards they do. 
And finally, we have what is potentially my favourite, and the entire redemption, as far as I'm concerned, of the entire Star Wars universe's ability to actually have ships. This is one of the reasons why I really do not understand the Imperial Star Destroyers. One of the reasons I... I understand their reasoning, their logic, but I still do not understand why. Because none of that adds up when you consider the capabilities of this. Someone's going to go, but Alex, you just critiqued the other one because it had its barbettes all on the side. This is its barbettes on the side. Yes, but the Venator is an aircraft, is a carrier. The Venator is there to carry starfighters to have a huge hangar where they can all get out and get in in the middle of there. So you do not have guns down the center because that would interfere in your operation of your aircraft of your parasite craft in space that makes sense you are not should not be dragging your venator class into the middle of the fight it can stay on its edges it can fight with the enemies and if necessary if they get close yeah it can blast away but it's got a hyperdrive and it's got fi hyperdrive equipment fi equipped fighters it does not need to be anywhere close to the battle if it doesn't want to be and that is its point and I love that, because that means it can be. You can have your Venators attacking one place, their fighters off in a group attacking another place, and maybe you've divided their fighters into three. You've got a third with the Venators going after their target. You've got the other thirds off attacking two different targets. And boom, straight in. It's amazing. It's a very good, flexible capability. And it has it carries troops. And it carries everything else it needs. And I know they are Jedi cruisers. I know everyone associates them after the, uh, after the Galactic Civil War with the Clone War. With the Jedi. And I can understand. But build a better version of the Venator. Because that, trust me, the Imperial Star Destroyer is not it. And they got rid of them all, which is even more stupid. Now, it's like I can understand the reasoning for why the Rebellion didn't get hold of any when they were being destroyed. I can understand that, unlike the Imperials who seem to be able to get a plunder everything they want out of the Republic's uh, scrapyards, for want of a better phraseology, to describe all the industrial complex dealing with their, well, stratus repurposing yards as well, uh, dealing with their work. Yet, I can understand why, yet still they would have been very good for the, uh, for the resistance. The rebellion could have really used some of these ships. Because they would have been their mobile bases. Instead of them having to base themselves on a planet with their fighters, etc. They could have these wandering around the outer rim. Wandering around, be keeping at the edges. Any time the Imperials turn up, disappear. No, we need to have fire an iron cannon and get off this planet because they're going to launch, launch a ground attack. It's a... Imperial fleet's arriving. Get us out of here now. We're gone. We left some fighters behind to cause them trouble. They'll be, uh, they'll go to a set, uh, they'll go to another system in a bit, and we'll meet them up uh, up with them in a third system from where we've gone. And we'll maybe send something uh, straight ahead to. Well, maybe they go through four systems to get to where we're going, and we go through three. And uh, we'll send someone else to the third system on their route. So that they're waiting to see if they're followed. It's just... It would have worked. These were re a really excellent design. I, I know they're not as rapid built as we often... As they've probably marketed. Because like the clone army, I'm fairly certain they, the design started earlier. So they're not a case of snap fingers, build them. But they're good ships. They are well-designed ships. There are problems with them. There are. There are problems with all Star Some Star Wars ships... I'm, I'm always confused and perplexed by the idea of having the bridge quite so high up and sticking out. 
I'm not sure if it's a point to doing that in space. It looks really cool. I do understand that and does allow a very imposing visage when you want to, you know, show people your ship and impress them. But still, personally, do you need to look out to be flying your ship in space? If you do, might I say that you've got something really problematic going on, considering the speeds of ships when they're moving through space, it, by the time you can see that object, it's probably too close for you to maneuver around it. Uh, or alternatively, it's big enough that you could see it from wherever you are on the ship. I, it's a planet. Or a star. Either way, if you really do want to have a visual sort of ability to see things, maybe lower down. Why at the top? Why at the top? Why not lower down? But... Still, exceptional ships. Really fast, really capable, really practical, and really good for their, uh, for, uh, for their purpose and their role in the world. These were some of the most capable ships I have ever seen in science fiction. And they also, one of the things I did note about it was they, they serve to heighten the capabilities of the opponents in that if you're in these ships and they are, you're, the Admiral is, or the Admiral, whoever the character is, is going, actually, you know, the ones we're going to be facing, they're, they're tough. You know they are tough. It makes you really appreciate the qualities of the other fleet and the other ships. Or, um, though I have to admit, going through the various options for the uh, their opponents was interesting. But I felt I couldn't do the other Star Destroyers and not have the Venators in. And the moment I had the Venators in, I realised that it... Yeah. It's a case of... There are reasons I can agree for the way the Imperial Star Destroyers are the way they are. But they don't make as much sense as the Venators. They really don't. So, summary. I enjoyed this video. I enjoyed going through and thinking through these ships and analysing them. And thinking about their capabilities and their qualities. And yes, I did put, end up putting in, in many ways, the top 12. I went through roughly 30 ships. I put in the top 12. Why? Because I've always believed it's far better to encourage things by positive. By saying, affirming when you like things and when things are done well, than by focusing on when things aren't done well. I think positive reinforcement is always better than negative. Saying things which are done well. The ships in Glyn Stewart's books. I've already mentioned this. and He is a very good friend, I will admit. I, the ship shape crew, uh, that's a team of myself. Drakinafell, um, Gareth, a.k.a. John Bull, and Dr. Dan. When we were in Canada, very nicely hosted us for dinner and spent... Most of the trip we were in Canada, America, being basically abducted and traveling around with us. I'm, I'm sure he was always happy to do so, but there are some pictures of where he's looking in the back. He's in the middle of the back seat going. Anyway, he was lovely. And his books are really good because he thinks through his ships. And that's really what I wanted to talk about because science fiction, when they think through the ships, the ships are really very good. You can tell when the ships were brought up by the writers like five minutes before they, uh, five minutes before they were filmed, because they have holes that you could drive. <sighs> Let, let's be honest, not trucks, but super tankers through. Um, the ones which have been fought through, they're good, and also some of these ships. I have to say, I think they've probably been fought through more by their fandoms than they have necessarily by the people who wrote them. 
because there are some brilliant explanations I read for why things are the way they are in the Imperial Star Destroyers. It was a very nice way of trying to reason out some stupid decisions, but there was a lot of thought and detail put into it. It's still a stupid decision, but I laud the people who tried to come with the reasonable reasons for why they have done it. So I can understand and accept that logic, and there's a, there's a log chain for why they're doing it, but it's a stupid logic. Because they shouldn't have done that. Because a very simple work of thinking, hang on, angles of gunfire, right then. Uh, the, these guns can fire this way, from this angle. Or if I put them in this position, I can design, they can fire this way. They can give me 270 degrees of fire. Uh, that's, more, that's more useful, because then I have them. And then I have, you know, four which can do roughly, well, four which can do roughly 270. These ones, which all can do about, well, let's let's be honest. Uh, I would say 180, but probably slightly more, more likely 200, 210. And um, those four, on, so, so you have six out of your eight bat barbettes can cover either side. So if you're if you're broadside, you've got six to engage. That's helpful. Out of four, you've got six. You've increased your firepower on each broadside by 50% with no extra guns. No extra cost. Now, I couldn't do this without considering the bonus, the density ship, but I will, before I get into that, um, I will say this. The question, of course, for today's one is, what do you think? Not any ships you would have liked to have seen me cover in this group. The Ancient Exploration Ship. Now, Destiny is not a capital ship per se. But it allows me to spend some time being rude about the Ancients in the whole British sarcastic manner. And honestly, to talk about some lessons of... Logistics, because presence, it's glorious, it's visible. That's an amazing, that looks like Thor's hammer in a way, going through the sky. That's just, it's brilliant. Capability though, 12 out of 20, because whilst it's very capable of long range, it, and it has all the, it has the ring room and has the ability to move around, it doesn't have certain things in terms of a, it only carries three shuttles, of which only one is available by the time uh, working by the end of the s second season, roughly. Uh, it, it's it's just not that good in terms of why it, it should have the ability to repair itself and its engines. It does in theory, but and I, you can argue well the ancients believed they'd always had the logistic train chain of the of the stargates to support it. Yeah, but relying on your extremely thin logistics chain not being cut at any point and never suffering any issues is text is basically first line textbook or a chapter one. What you do not do in logistical perspective if you're going on a long range operation, you're either design you either. Fit your vessel out to be self-sufficient and able to repair itself in every sh way and form. Or you design a trunk-like logistics system. Which has multiple layers of overlapping competency and multiple different systems to deliver. It fits the ancients to a T because that's what they normally do. They design something which is technologically amazing. It's got all this game. But then you sort of look at it and go, but it has all these drawbacks. And at any point, have you thought about what happens if the other side gets a vote? Huh? No, they wouldn't have thought about that. In, in the ancients' world, no, no other side gets a vote. Yet they apparently have the wraith, they have other ancients who have decided to form themselves into actually being worshipped gods the Ori all these things and yet somehow they never think when they're designing any of these things 
we might come across someone who's scary and dangerous and we need to be all protected and supported. Because of its whole uniqueness of its capabilities, its ability to recharge with the sun, etc., and those uh, of suns, etc., and all those things, you have to give it 14 out of 20 for uniqueness and its, you know, its capabilities. But yeah, overall 78 out of 100. I, its weapon system makes sense and able to be recharged as well. It's got shields, all those things. Got a main gun which is situated on the bottom and can only therefore engage targets which are below it. Now, admittedly, in space that shouldn't matter because you can orientate yourself up, but things like this, you sort of go, well, hang on. I know you're an exploration ship, I know that. But surely you could have made a recessed turret if you consider the size of the ship. You could have made a, you know, a couple of recessed ones so you had one on the top as well. And your secondaries, you probably would want them recessed as well. So basically, things though that it, the reason you want the, the recessed and covered is so that they couldn't be taken out by a surprise attack. That people wouldn't be able to see them and quickly take them out. That they would be protected until you wanted them and then you could activate them. And it's the same with other systems, like things like the, the garden area, the dome area, which. Uh, yeah, the shield needs to be working and all these things are protected, but you'd have thought also you'd have had sh covers, etc., which would go over that to protect it when you're going into a sun, because if you're going to be recharging off stars, off those sort of systems, you probably need to have a backup just in case there are any issues with your shielding. You can presume your shielding's always going to be perfect and you can always rely on it, or you can be sensible and go, you know what, it probably will work, but if I ha how much effort is there to design a shutter system when I'm so capable of this technology that I can just finish? When I'm designing a ship of this size, this weight, this complexity already, how much extra effort am I adding in to put in a shutter over a dome? How much? It's a good ship. It's an interesting ship. But again, you see this and you see this with all these ships. They they're really good at designing them to fit within the psyche of the race that's designing them. And the ancients have a constant thread of ambitious capable delivers a capable vessel. But don't usually think through the issues which can come with that. Anyway, what have we got coming up? Next week we have ooh, rigging, I think that is. Uh, no, ranging and stabilizing, not rigging. Uh, how gunnery evolved from 1860 to 1960. That'll be fun. And kind of fits with this week's live, which is Patreon 85, Nick G's Evolution of Small Craft Armament during World War II. How did things change for, for PT boats, motor gun boats, E boats, say, Schnell boats during the war? Mm, yeah. Honestly, things mostly changed in terms of how they detected their targets, but it's going to be interesting to talk it through. Take care, thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Toodles. And apologies, this has been late, but I'm re recording it for about the sixth time and. I've still got the issues going on, as I've mentioned in other videos, at home with my family having um, asthma attacks and not feeling very well. It's just... I honestly don't have much of an idea of how to fix it at the moment, but I'm, I'm trying to work towards something. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. It all really matters. Honestly, with the way universities are going and contract lecturing is going, I could see there being a point this year where YouTube will be my only income stream. I hope that won't be for long, and I hope the contracts will come through, etc. But I could see that coming, and the reason I'm not absolutely terrified of that 
in terms of also dealing with all the problems going on in my family, etc., is because I know that as long as I continue to do my best here and to deliver, I hope, good quality videos, I also will get support. And that means a lot. So thank you. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. And I hope I didn't spend too much time explaining why the Imperial Star Destroyers are just so bad.